I like to secure down the Cobell retractor with a towel clip to the Coban that is wrapped around the patient's arm. Now, our landmarks at this stage uh, include uh, this fullness that you see right here, and this is actually the bicipital sheath, which is full of fluid and most likely some uh, small fragments of bone or cartilage. We have the coracoid process here. Our retractor is above the rotator interval, and we have the three sisters or the anterior circumflex vessels. We need to identify the subscapularis tendon, and the way that we'll do that, if you notice, there's a thin sheath of tissue still remaining over the top, which we can leave in place. The lateral border of the subscap is the biceps tendon. The inferior border of the subscapularis tendon is the anterior circumflex vessels. And the superior border of the subscapularis is the rotator interval, which is right here. We're going to better define that by making a small window into our rotator interval by the coracoid process. And when that happens, you'll see that the fluid and debris from the joint can oftentimes be expressed in this area. We can see the amount of inflammation and changes that we see in this, and we can take that out. Oftentimes, there's a tremendous amount of fluid that will come out with this. We'll take and move our retractor into the glenohumeral joint above the upper rolled edge of the subscapularis to identify that superior aspect. The next step that we're going to do is we're going to ligate the three sisters or the anterior circumflex vessels down at the inferior aspect of the incision. So we'll prepare that. We'll take a hemostat, and then we'll take a number one vicral suture. We'll go ahead and ligate medially and leave the sutures a little bit long. And then we'll take a second stitch, and pass around more laterally. This is a useful step to control the bleeding throughout the surgical procedure, as these vessels do have a tendency to uh, bleed continuously if they're not adequately controlled early on in the surgical procedure. Now we'll go to our subscapularis release. The subscapularis can be elevated off of the bone with a number of different techniques. The most common technique that was uh, initially described was to do a trans tendinous approach, which is commonly used for instability surgery also. The second technique, which was subsequently described, was to take the subscapularis directly off of the lesser tuberosity and this, is, again, is quite effective in assisting with improving the options available for improving external rotation after surgery. The third option, which is rarely, if ever, used, is called a Z-plasty, where the subscapularis is taken off uh, with a part of the tendon uh, in a Z-type fashion. Part of the tendon is left on the lesser tuberosity. There's a Z through the tendinous portion of the subscapularis. The only indication for this would be a prior surgical procedure where the two parts of the subscapularis were overlapped, something like a putty plat procedure, which is a rare operation at this time. A newer procedure that's been recommended is actually taking off the subscapularis with a small fragment of bone, a lesser tuberosity, or a lesser tuberosity osteotomy. And the initial description was taking off a large fragment, and other surgeons have recommended a smaller fragment. As we discussed uh, earlier on in this procedure, uh, our plan, since this patient has greater than 20 degrees of external rotation, is to do a trans tendinous approach to the subscapularis. We need to identify the boundaries of the subscapularis. The superior border is to the rotator interval. The lateral border is where the biceps tendon is located. And the inferior border is where we ligated the anterior circumflex vessels. We need to leave a small tag of tendon uh, with the humerus so that we have something to sew back to, both the soft tissue and the bone. But we also need to make sure that we have enough adequate tendon medially. We do not want to go to the muscular tendonous junction or this becomes a compromised situation in terms of repairing at the end of the procedure. So we'll identify that top edge by our appointed homen in this area here. Our inferior edge is down here by the vessels and we'll draw a diagonal which matches with the articular surface. So it's not straight directly down on the humerus, but a slight diagonal. And when we get to this region, there may be some small feet or branches to the anterior circumflex vessels. We have to be a little careful about the bleeding here. So we're releasing the subscapularis with a trans tendinous approach. I can check and make sure that there's adequate tissue laterally to repair back down to, and we can see that there's adequate tendon medially so that a secure suture can be placed through this. We'll release the subscapularis up to the level of the rotator interval. And then once we get the superior corner of the subscapularis 
released, we'll then be able to put a tag stitch in this tendon. So we'll take a number two fiber wire, please, and pass this through the tendon and the capsule to control our upper corner of the subscapularis. We'll continue our release on the subscapularis. And as we go inferior with our release, we'll then take and gradually externally rotate the arm. Our goal is to peel off the subscapularis with the capsule as a single unit from the humerus. And we'll continue inferiorly until we're approximately at the 6 o'clock position of the humerus. As we get to this inferior border, we saw where our anterior circumflex vessels were located, and that marks the inferior portion of the tendinous portion of the subscapularis. So we'll go ahead and tag that with another number two fiber wire suture. And with these two sutures, we have good control over our subscapularis, and we can move this however we need to to improve our exposure or to manage the soft tissues. Again, we're continuing around on the humerus inferiorly to approximately the 6 o'clock position. And we'll know that our release is completed when we see the fibers of the uh, latissimus at the very inferior aspect of the glenohumeral joint. Now, frequently there can be some very large osteophytes in this area. If the release cannot be completed, some of the osteophytes may need to be removed at this time of the procedure to be able to get to the inferior aspect of the glenohumeral joint. We can see at this point we're around to the 6 o'clock position. Although there's significant damage to the articular cartilage, there is not the often typical uh, inferior beard of osteophytes that we see in osteoarthritis, which may be in our way, may need to be removed to complete the capsule release. And then as we come inferior to ensure that we're able to expose the anatomic neck of the humerus, we're clear off the soft tissues, and we can see this white band of fibers at the inferior aspect of our exposure, and these white fibers here are the latissimus dorsi tendon. So that's when we know we have adequate exposure on the humeral side. If there's a case where there's severe contracture, which is not the situation here, the capsule release can be continued around on the bony aspect of the humerus, taking care to avoid drifting medially where the axillary nerve will come into play.